I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you because I was already twice there, so I don't want people to get tired of my face. <laughs> no, absolutely. Please. And you did a fantastic job last year, so thank you very much for doing it again. It was really yeah, a pleasure. so uh, we did something uh, uh, not similar, but uh, in a similar format, talking about um, more of a, like um, Yugoslav heritage and uh, unwanted uh, identities and so on. Uh, but this is a slightly different uh, panel, so we are going kind of to move away from these uh, grand narratives and what was Yugoslavia, was it like a, a totalitarian kind of a country with a secret police running it, uh, you know, like a police state, or was it a, a failed uh, modernist uh, socialist project, or was it a really lived in socialism and so on. So we are going to move away from these grand narratives and go into more kind of a personal stories, how we uh, remember, uh, some memories and, and storytelling. Uh, and I have a, a great honor to introduce the panel, uh, which is really nicely gender balanced. Uh, so we have uh, just one uh, man who is, uh, I think, very comfortable uh, among uh, us uh, women here. So I will introduce uh, the panel is starting from um, Maria. So, I can just find my paper. And uh, for people who were here from uh, one o'clock, uh, you got the chance to see the film I care for you, uh, made by Maria. So, Maria Ratkovic, Vidakovic, uh, graduated film, TV, and performing arts production uh, from the Academy of Dramatic Art in uh, Zagreb. She has more than 10 years' experience in the festival event management and film industry. Uh, but she specialized in new film and developing new talent. And she was employed at the Croatian Film Association, blah, blah. And then, uh, uh, many, I don't think that we ever listen to really these details in, in, in this kind of intro. Uh, but uh, what is important now is that she made this film, I Care For You, her first film as a director. And she now lives and works in uh, Sweden, as we saw in that film. And then uh, next to her is Olivia Sujic, who is a writer living in London. Uh, her work has appeared in publications including New York Times, Paris Review, Financial Times, Guardian. She's the author of Sympathy, her 2017 debut novel, which was a finalist for the Salerno European Book Award. Uh, and it's been translated into five uh, languages so far. And Exposure, named an Irish Times, Evening Standard, and White Review Book of the Year. 2018. And then, next to her, very pleased uh, to sit with us, is uh, Vladimir Rukovsky Korica. He's a lecturer in Central and East European Studies at the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Glasgow. He completed many degrees and uh, uh, masters and PhDs and so on. Oh, thank you. <laughs> many, many. It's a long list. I can't read through all of them. But uh, he was uh, teaching for several years at LSE, and he was also assistant professor at the National Research University High School of Economics in Moscow. And he wrote a book titled The Economic Struggle for Power in Titus Yugoslavia from World War II to Non-Alignment. And then next to me, uh, Vesna Goldsworthy, uh, her uh, maiden name Bielogalic, and I can properly pronounce it, unless I mean, I like so many other people who tried. Uh, and she's a Serbian writer poet. She's from Belgrade, again, many degrees. Uh, can I just jump in here? I can see that this is my Wikipedia entry, which is written by Martians. It is all true, but in a rather strange order. So. <laughs> yeah, doesn't matter. So basically, what we need to know is now she's teaching at Exeter University. And her books include Inventing Mauritania, uh, then a memoir of Chernobyl Strawberries, and a collection of poems, uh, The Angel of Salonika. And there are also some books that uh, tribute to her favorite authors, yeah, which is rewriting of uh, Great Gatsby in a way, and also Anna Karenina, uh, which is uh, titled Monsieur K. Um, so that is what you need to know so far about the panelists. Are you happy with the introduction? I'm gonna miss something. Yeah. Excellent. So, so this afternoon is going to be uh, about storytelling, uh, not only uh, how we um, memorize certain things, but also how we pass on things that have been told to us. Because as you can see, uh, we are 
uh, kind of a belong to different generations, uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s. You can kind of uh, guess who belongs to which uh, generation here. Uh, and I would like because we started. Uh, yeah, so we can uh, we can start actually uh, with uh, talking a little bit because it opened the day IKEA for you. So I would like to start with uh, Maria, and uh, especially because I watched it uh, previously this film and then uh, today again, uh, and uh, I felt quite emotional, you know, watching it because I see uh, in that film you really tormented by multiple identities and uh, being kind of a, almost burdened by this legacy of this uh, really important figure, which is your uh, granddad. And I would like you to tell us a little bit about it. What is Yugoslavia for you as your lived experience, although you were really tiny, and then what is passed on to you that you had to kind of uh, deal with, sometimes felt in this film as a little bit suffocated, you know, because of that uh, legacy. And uh, what is Yugoslavia to you? Well, uh, to be honest, I still don't know do I have a right answer to that question, what is Yugoslavia to me, because uh, one of the photos uh, which you see in the first part of the film, me with the Yugoslavian flag, I was now thinking when it was made, and it was made in 2006 during Moto Film Festival in Croatia, and I remember the feeling when I saw that flag, Oh, Yugoslavian flag, I have to make a photo about that. Why? Because I was taught from my uh, very beginning that Yugoslavia is some idealistic state, that uh, we all lived better before than now. And uh, I was believing in that, I didn't question that opinion, that uh, values, nothing until my son was born uh, six years ago and uh, I started thinking, okay, which kind of values, which kind of opinions I want to tell him. I want to, not only me, but me and my husband. And then I realized, okay, what is actually this Yugoslavia we all talk about in the family? And when I started talking to my husband, who is uh, born and raised in a completely different family, but still Yugoslavian, idealistic, uh, which uh, idealized Yugoslavia, we both agreed, okay, we don't know do we believe in that, in that story, and do we want to believe in that, in that story, and we just figure out we have to find our own identity, our own story, especially because uh, you don't have only Yugoslavian identity on my side of the family, you also have both Croatian and Serbian identity. We are Serbs who stayed in Croatia during the war and everything would happen. So when you mix all that, you really uh, ask yourself, okay, what am I going to say to my son, who is now already started asking, uh, because we travel a lot both to Serbia and to Croatia. Uh, he's already started missing it. Okay, uh, well, he know the, knows that there was a war. Why was the, there a war? He cannot understand that. So I uh, sometimes I uh, joke that yeah, uh, we didn't know what is a real identity. Then we went to Sweden to have completely new identity and to have like completely clear start, but is that a real clean start? Yeah, I watched once, uh, and it is a really interesting one, and I do recommend it. It's a talk uh, conducted uh, by, now philosopher, I can't remember the name, but with uh, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, who died in the meantime, and the talk was on happiness, but they actually talked about that a lot. And, uh, and in that talk, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman constantly talked about how actually uh, past how much ever you try to kind of escape, it, it kind of haunts you. It catch up with you. You know, you can never really get rid of that uh, past. And what is also interesting now, when you are mentioning idealized kind of a, a version of Yugoslavia, your brother, who is very, very young in the film, who is like 16, but comes up with this claim that he knows what Yugoslavia was and that his mother, your mother, has this kind of utopian version of it. 
how come that he can come up with this claim having no living experience of actually what Yugoslavia was? Uh, you mean uh, how come he can have like this? Uh, because he was born in 1999, and uh, he also didn't go through all that poor experience and I think in shaping my identity also during the whole world war, war time uh, my uh, grandfather was in Belgrade so yeah we were living in Croatia four to five times a year we were traveling to Belgrade and it wasn't that easy and I mean uh, you had to travel through Slovenia, Hungary to, came, to come there and uh, already there when I was six, seven, eight, I was completely like, okay. I remember when we were uh, one day in, um, uh, I don't know how you call it, it's shelter. Oh, shelter, yeah, shelter. Uh, and uh, so in Croatia, in my hometown, in Karlovac, and some of the neighbors were asking, okay, now uh, this is not ours, uh, the other ones are uh, bombing. But this is maybe ours, I'm not sure. And then I asked mother, okay, who are ours? And she was uh, she said, Okay, let's go from here. <laughs> You're not staying here anymore in the shelter with the neighbors. <laughs> so he doesn't didn't have that experience. He lived like in twenty first century, not <laughs> so I think that's why he has that clear opinion. And to be honest, Croatia uh, in my childhood, although it was 19th at the beginning of 2000, it was not that, uh, I wouldn't say, uh, conservative as it, it, as it is now in the last six, seven years when he was forming, which is also very interesting. <laughs> Okay, Olivia, you were um, basically bo uh, born and bred in, in the UK. Very little kind of uh, connections with uh, Yugoslavia, simply because you're very young. So uh, you said that your very first encounter was in uh, 1997, when you went for a funeral of your grandfather, uh, Misha, uh, who was again a communist and a, a very kind of a prominent uh, uh, at that time in, in that country. and that. Uh, in a way, you're writing now a novel as a uh, where, uh, Asylum Road, which will focus on a, on a person who is a refugee of the Yugoslav wars. So, since it can be only a true fiction, because you have no uh, lived experience, or you haven't been through that experience, how are you going to basically uh, do your research, and how, what are you going to draw on in order to write such a story? given that uh, you don't have that kind of experience. Well, I obviously, it is fiction, I'm not writing some kind of, um, I'm not attempting to present myself as someone who has directly experienced any of that. Um, and it's very true that I haven't, in fact, why I'm interested in, in this, in trying to explore or mine some of my own family history is because I feel like I lack that. That's precisely, I think, why I'm interested in, in it in the first place. And yes, I hadn't had any, encounter in the sense of I haven't physically gone to the former Yugoslavia until 97 but obviously my my family so my grandparents were both still alive until 97 and my grandmother was alive until I was 18 so I had the sense of being around her talking to her about it growing up with her stories so I had encountered it but in this kind of either mythologized or just very story narrative sense rather than like you say, direct experience, but any generation can't have direct experience for long before. So in terms of this next book, I actually started thinking about it more from the perspective of someone who had grown up here, and I was born in 88, and is now experiencing the UK at some point, who knows, leaving the EU, and what it feels like to be invested in that kind of union, and, and then feel like you're, it's in some way breaking apart, and then I thought about, I guess, what, I went on a trip to Sarajevo and I met a man there who runs the War Childhood Museum. Well, he's my age exactly. He was also born in 88 and he set it up not to try and present a narrative that is the usual kind you find in museums, which is either a kind of aestheticized thing or it's a very much 
you know, it's the kind of knowledge, here is the kind of state sanctioned narrative of what happened here. What they've done is he crowdsourced for items, personal items from people who grew up during the siege, and now it's anyone who grew up during a war in their childhood all over the world. But these items have been donated and they come with personal stories and they're often very banal, like a tape recorder or you know packaging that was collected from foreign food packages, um, all that kind of thing, and they have their own stories. And I was really moved by that in the sense that so much of it seemed obviously hugely different from my own experience growing up. But in terms of what they remembered, it was it was like a Michael Jackson song that I also remembered, or it was like using kind of certain cartoons, all that kind of stuff, and I was struck more than I expected to and moved by how similar in some respects our childhoods had been. And I started thinking about what would have happened if my grandparents hadn't left for the first time at least during the war, then they went back and they came back to the UK in the 50s, and then my grandfather moved back and was there until the beginning of the 80s. But I sort of started to think, I guess, about how often what we're drawn to write about is that thing that we have a tiny bit of knowledge of, but the shadows are more compelling somehow. So in terms of my research, it's first-hand accounts. Um, in fact, I remember when I was very young reading Zlatter's diary, which is obviously her account of the siege. I'm not talking about being in the siege. This, this girl is like five when she leaves, so it's much more about her experience of being displaced and growing up in the UK. And to an extent, I have felt that myself because, and this probably says more about the state of diversity in the primary school I went to, but my surname stuck out. It felt radioactive on the, on the register. It wasn't, and at that time, obviously, if you went home and watched things on the news, every itch was like Milosevic, and, and then there was my surname. No one had any kind of positive associations with it. And people kind of looked at me like I was physically kind of disintegrating in front of them. Um, and I, I internalize that as children do with any feeling of difference. Um, and I, I think I've always had this really, um, not necessarily healthy desire to try and fit in as a result. And it's only now that I've started to feel like embracing or examining at least some of that, of, of that past. And also going through my grandparents' letters and all the kind of stuff that they didn't want to talk about for so long. I think my father, really wanted, he was, you know, he learned to speak with his British accent by listening to the World Service, and now he sounds incredibly posh, but it's because he wanted not to have a foreign accent, and I think he really wanted to fit in, whereas I am of that, you know, second generation who suddenly wants to explore more than perhaps the previous one. Can you tell us, because there is a parallel between the Maria's story that starts with the grandfather with his strong kind of values, and absolute no question and doubt about the Yugoslav project, you know. So can you tell us a little bit, because what they found is really interesting, how your grandparents met and how they were also staunch kind of communists uh, initially. So yeah, I recognized some elements of my own fondness for my grandfather, except that my grandfather had a stroke at, at around the time I was learning to communicate and to speak, that's when he could no longer communicate. So that's something I obviously really regret. But in terms of feeling an affinity with him, um, he was sort of very sentimental and sweet with me. I was his first and, and you know, female grandchild, so I think I was, I was his favorite. And, um, and I, I sort of got the di a different feeling from my grandmother growing up. She was quite stern. Um, I think she was sort of a bit, a bit disappointed by life, and especially by my grandfather. They kind of ended up growing apart. Um, but when they first met, um, she, who had been born in Belgrade and he in Montenegro, um, they were both communists, but her, par her father had been a colonel in the army and were definitely not on the side of the partisans, or they, you know. And so they basically disowned her. And then when, you know, when one of her brothers ended up being killed and another was sent to a prisoner of war camp, they, you know, just stopped speaking to her entirely. Um, and she basically chose my grandfather over that, obviously. Um, they were, I think they first met because they were smashing up a Nazi-funded lab in Belgrade University. Completely neither of them were scientists, so I don't know if they would have done the same thing. If they, um, you know, she was a, a linguist and, a, and he was a lawyer, but I think that 
part of why it was so difficult for her then to adjust to life here was because she'd chosen this idea of Yugoslavia and this communist version of life and then that hadn't worked out for her either. And so some of the sacrifices didn't maybe feel so. So she was the one from whom I sensed question marks, whereas I think he had bought into it and had sacrificed maybe as much. Thank you. Uh, Vladimir, are you ready to tell us something about your childhood? Because you also belong to the 80s uh, generation. Uh, you were fairly young when the whole dissolution of a country uh, took place, and you actually witnessed it from outside. So can you tell us about inside and outside experience? Okay, yeah. <clears throat> so thank you everyone for coming and for the invitation to be here. I'm not known for succinct um, discussion, so uh, I'm, I'm glad that Svetlana is here to uh, keep me as short as possible. Uh, I never pass a chance to not you know, speak about Yugoslavia. It's um, a bit like the film that you saw in the in in in, in the um, you know the, the first film that we saw. I, I had a slightly overbearing mother right? <laughs> um, who 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 loved Yugoslavia and yeah, it's disappeared. It's a bit like your grandfather led to a kind of silence and very emotional discussions at home often ending in tears and I find it quite difficult not to. So if I, if I don't actually cry it will be an amazing experience today. Um, so that's already I think something of a statement about what Yugoslavia means to me. Uh, I was born in 1983 and I remember vividly um, departing in 1991. So I had a, a you know, um, you know, a childhood which I would call eventful, even though I didn't live in a city which was war torn. I was in Belgrade. Um, you know, at that time there were no bombs uh, being dropped on us. Uh, there was still not exactly a war, even though I saw on television scenes of the Yugoslav army bombing things in Zagreb, and I didn't really fully understand. I'd been brought up with that story of brotherhood and unity of the Yugoslav peoples, uh, and then to watch it disintegrate. On, on the telly, it was very difficult. It was also very difficult to go to school where your friends were bullied because they were Croatian or Albanian. So, you know, there was a kind of a funny story where a guy comes up to me in, in school. I'm in third grade, he's in, let's say, fourth grade. He gets his knife out, what we used to call the skakavats, yeah? So he opens a, a flick knife. And he puts it to my throat and he says, Who are you for, Milosevic or Drashkovic? You know, these are the two main politicians, the guy in power and the main opposition. Um, and I sort of stared back at him. Well, I mean, I couldn't stare back at him, he was behind me. But I was thinking, like, you know, what do I say to him? And I could, uh, you know, obviously, who was I for? I was for the person my parents were for. And I couldn't remember his name. <laughs> Bugger. You know, and you sort of sit there and I'm trying to remember and say, Is it really, you're not helping with a knife? Can you, can you? Slightly let go, and then another boy comes, and he's from, let's say, grade six, and he flicks his own knife open, he's got two buddies, and he says, I know where you live, leave him alone, and this is kind of surreal in, in the school playground, and ultimately this boy leaves, and, and I'm fine, the other guy puts his, uh, you know, closes the flick knife, and he puts in a sock, and he puts it back in his pocket, he sits down with me, his arm around me, he says, okay, now, who are you really? <laughs> Um, and in a sense, I think when you leave a country in that kind of way, um, you, you know, some people choose to forget it. In my case, I began to obsess, so I tried to read everything I could about it, which probably explains why I became a historian. Um, and what Yugoslavia began to mean to me kind of changed over many years. The more I found out, the more difficult it was to make up your mind. But um, in a way, growing up in Zimbabwe, which is where I ended up, another great place, um, <laughs> you get you got a certain other sense of what Yugoslav meant to be Yugoslav, and I'll, I'll very briefly kind of try to encapsulate this with stories about school. Um, in school, my teacher would ask, you know, at the beginning, well, your teacher would ask you what your name is, you know, you stand up because of your surname, and he says, where are you from? And I said, Yugoslavia. And he says, that place doesn't exist, where are you really from? And I began to kind of become very resistant to define myself beyond Yugoslavia, and it was very difficult to have to explain Serbia, Croatia, and so on. Um, and I refused. I, I simply restated Yugoslavia, and he said to me, that's right, you don't even know where you come from because we people are killing each other. He was white, by the way. Um, and I kind of began to understand, and I, you know, my parents' story of the third world made a lot of sense to me. 
The whites, they were the bad guys, they were the racists, and they were certainly racist to me, believe me, right? But the black boys couldn't care less, right? And Yugoslavia, in a sense, I think was a quintessential story of the 20th century, among many of its failed projects, but a very noble project in some senses, I think, it was a country, particularly in the second variation, that came out of a majority peasant struggle. And the 20th century, if you ask me, I mean, its dominant feature is the peasant masses of the world coming into, in some sense, for a very short period, ownership over their own destiny. Um, it was decolonization across much of the world, a struggle against Europe, sorry, I don't like Europe. Um, and it was a kind of struggle that I understood because my granddad was also a communist, my grandma, by the way, was also a communist, and the, you know, my other grandpa and grandma were also communists. They all fought in the Second World War, and they fought in a struggle which was a struggle against a foreign invader, a much more advanced invader, and, and the sense that you could stand in solidarity with other peoples who were different, skin, color, and so on, it, it taught me a lesson. So I'll stop there. So, uh, no, you don't, you, you don't stop there. I ask you another question and then you stop there. I'm wondering, because you're a historian and you're surrounded, I saw this picture, a new Facebook picture, is uh, in an archive, you know, where you're like uh, dealing just with one year and then a presidency or whatever you were doing in, uh, recently in Belgrade. So how that kind of a knowledge, your professional insight into what was really going on, you know, ground level, kind of uh, matches your memories or your parents' versions of what was going on in Yugoslavia. So how this private sphere now with this professional insight, how they correlate? Oh God, I wish you hadn't asked me that, but I should have expected it. Um, you know, in a sense, I kind of watched that again in your film about um, your, your brother talking back to your parents about how it wasn't quite as ideal. <laughs> So in, this, in some senses, I mean, can an archive really tell you what a place was really like? Uh, I mean, you know, my parents were both Communist Party members as well. They both left, incidentally, when Milosevic took over the party in the late 1980s. Um, that's partially why we also left the country, because they disagreed with him. Uh, and they really idealized what happened before, and I don't. I mean, you know, the more I read about it, the more I have a sense that, look, you know, in many senses, this was a country that you know, had economic growth because partially it was exploiting its own population. This is what a lot of these, you, you know, the Eastern Bloc did. I think that's what most countries do. Whether it was the state that did it or it was private companies is a li little less important. Um, but in a way, I mean, I don't know. I, I quite, I just. Both of these films, in a sense, kind of spoke to me today, and I'm sorry to kind of go back to films as opposed to the archives, but in a kind of way, I mean, I felt the family story that we watched, um, and, and I, I guess when you leave a country aged eight, and you watch it on the telly disintegrate, because we're now talking about the instant CNN moment where you can watch it all happen, and then on the other hand, your, your, your Yugoslavia is the one that you're brought up with by your parents for a very long time. That kind of speaks to you. Did anyone here watch um, goodbye Lenin. Yeah. So I mean, in a way, that's me, right? Okay, I'm sorry for those of you who haven't seen it, but it's about a boy who's locked up in 1989 in the GDR fighting against the dictatorship. His mum is a true believer in the system, she's a teacher, she collapses on hearing the news and ends up in hospital and, you know, basically doesn't leave the hospital in the entire film. She's in a coma and then doesn't really realise the GDR is falling apart. He tries to recreate it for her. And the film ends with him saying, I'm recreating it essentially as it should have been rather than how it was. Mm. And in a sense, that's what my sec the second film for me was about, because the second film, for those of you who saw it, was about an occupation of, of a cinema. I, I, since about 2002, when I first returned to Yugoslavia for, or Yugoslavia for some extended period in time, I became a political activist on the Marxist left. And I've, in, you know, I've been over and over involved in various occupations. I've been to places where workers take over factories. I've been in student occupations. And in, in that kind of way, you kind of, when you're a historian, you kind of, you're, you know, what you're doing in the 1950s, you know where it's ended up today. And it's kind of difficult not to see it as a continuum of this kind of, you're, you, you see the ruins of what was being built when you're in the archives. And it's a kind of weird, it's a weird sensation. You know where it ends up, and every every moment in the archives is both a kind of joy of discovery, but it's also an incredible pain because constantly you're just reminded of everything. 
It's very typical. Yeah. Now talking about the pain and the wounds, uh, we are coming to Vesna. But before I ask you something and actually cite one um, little passage from the Chernobyl strawberries, 